The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. You wouldn't believe how tiny America is, right? You wouldn't believe how tiny Canada is. So the maps and the globes that people see, they have a distortion factor. It's a purposed uh, distortion factor. Once you see those sizes, you'll start to see things in context. Once you start seeing orientation of the continents, that really, that normally blows people's minds. And then when you match that with actual satellite uh, topography, then you get the idea. Then you really begin to see. But that's not the only thing that's uh, distorted or inflamed in the people's minds. It's a lot of things like that that will have people, and let's go ahead and face it, a lot of countries do not like America. Why? Because the people are prideful, very prideful. And they did that on purpose. And, and in fact, that's how we are surviving. Because if you can have a cause that is concrete, uh, you can actually indoctrinate or educate people to believe in certain ideologies that will uh, have a continuation effect upon that nation. But now we live in a time where everything is being challenged. You guys will ultimately learn the truth about the sizes of these continents, secondary oceans, all sorts of things, different sea life, life in the atmospheres. To learn about the Earth in general is a shocker. It's a, it's a real shocker. But there's one thing you're going to have to get used to, is that while most people have a pride behind their education, all right, think of this. When you are educated, when you actually go to college, I want you to, guys to think of what education is. You ready? You go to school, and what do you, what do you learn about in truth? What is, it, what is it that is really qualifying you to have a master's or, you know, a doctor's in a subject? What is it? I'll tell you. But uh, other than being a medical doctor, other than being an engineer, those two fields, all the other fields, with the exception of some, uh, geology and certain studies of life. What you're actually doing is you're taking somebody else's architecture. You're learning all about it and you're going to add or make your contribution to what somebody else built. This is how they continue with nations. They educate people on systems, on the ways, traditions, right? And if you know them well enough and you know how to incorporate them in the everyday life uh, and you can teach others to do that, you become an expert in that field. And they have you go out and teach other people about what somebody else built. Now, we're not talking about the human body, geology, the biologists. We're not talking about that. That indeed is a study of you know animals and various life forms that are in the earth connected to it. And mathematics, of course, but all the other studies... What they do is they build an idea of the architects that came long before you. And when you perfect the learning of somebody else or what somebody else built, then you have a degree. And you go out and you ensure, by way of pride, a sense of uh, belonging, a sense of responsibility. You go out and make sure that everybody else learns what you know. Thus, generation to generation, you have things, you know, you have a nation going forward with the same ideology, same old stuff, right? Same old stuff. The problem these days is that everything is being challenged. The only reason I'm getting into this is because I'm telling you right now they're going to start disclosing more and more about these uh, UAPs, about the life forms that are here already, about the life forms that have been in your history since the beginning, about some of the bigger life forms, some of the uh, benevolent life forms, some of the malevolent life forms. I can tell you this, a skunk is more dangerous than any of the life forms they're going to talk about. How about that? A skunk is more dangerous than any of these entities that they'll discuss. A skunk can do you more damage than they can. What they normally do, these things have always been intertwined with humanity. They are the agenda makers. You've not been uh, fighting against people. You've not been wrestling against something that people made. You've been wrestling against plans that were initiated by Keserat from the beginning. And if you read the book of Enoch, and if you become well-versed in the book of Jasher, if you read the Old Testament to find who the enemy is, you'll begin to see it's quite simple. Let me discuss with or not real quick so I can move on. Because the title of this, the title of our talk tonight, guys, deals with are you ready or not? In fact, it's uh, Future Walk. 
be ready, brethren, is a time limit. Now, I'll tell you right now, a lot of people right now, the mark of this conversation, uh, they're not ready. It's the bottom of the hour, and a lot of people are not ready. Not because they have no idea what's happening in the world, no. It's because they have not made definitive decisions in their own lives. You being ready or not, right, it doesn't mean you have to have a bulletproof vest or live in a concrete bunker. That's not going to make you ready. What's going to make you ready is if your temple is prepared. You're going to have your temple prepared because if it's not in the standing, Jesus said it must be in, you're not going to go with the Lord. Why? Because we're not going to trick our way into heaven. We're not going to fool God somehow. We're not going to appeal to his uh, uh, sensitive side to have an excuse for all we chose to do here. Here's a fact. The more spiritual you become, the less you have to do with all sin. How about that? The more you become like a child of the living God, you will have less and less and less to do with all types of sin. You will not choose that path of iniquity. That's not what you're going to do. But if you're not growing spiritually, you're going to struggle to the very last day. Now, before you said, that's a pretty hefty mandate. Well, that's a mandate that the Christ gave all of us. That's exactly what Jesus said. In fact, Jesus is the one that's able to keep us from falling. And in fact, he said, if we continue to fall, it's because we're, what? In a state of rebellion. It's impossible for an obedient person to fall. It's very easy for a disobedient person to fall. See, in truth, we've been given ourselves excuses. We have been given ourselves a pass, haven't we? And then when times like these come around, when they start to disclose things that you thought was make-believe, people start getting scared. Well, what does that mean? They're disclosing this. The Word of God is so rich in what it contains, but it's also very toe-stopping. It will stop on your toes. And I'm going to tell you something. I love it when the Word of God stomps on my toes. Do you know why? Because the day I think I've made it, if I ever sit here or stand here, and I think that somehow all of my efforts are good to go, that I have done enough, I'm in trouble. Because that's also the day I give up. If the Lord said we are to strive daily, we are to press daily, then you better believe our lives have been designed to press through everything. There's something in every day of our lives we must get over. We all want to grow. We do. We all desire to grow. We all desire to be pleasing. But then we talk ourselves into not persevere or we got to go over some things. Nobody should be caught in, in these endless loopholes of mankind or of the darkness of these spiritual entities. Because I'll say it again. If our temples, if these temples that we live in, if we don't understand that, first of all, you are the temple of God. Hopefully everybody understands this. It's, it's real easy to. When you accept Christ as the last sacrifice, which was given to mankind, when you accept Christ, you're accepting that sacrifice for your personal sins. You cannot accept Christ if you have no sin. You can't do it. Because to accept Christ is to accept the sacrifice. You don't accept a person and just say, well, I accept you. No. When you accept Christ, what you're actually accepting is the sacrifice that he died on the cross. And when you accept it, you accept that his death and his blood spilt covered your iniquity. Now, if you accept that, if, if somebody truly accepted that, was one of the last things they would do. If somebody sacrificed themselves for me because I was about to be persecuted for the misdeeds of my life, yet I accept the sacrifice of somebody else, the last thing I'm going to want to do is void that sacrifice. So if somebody died to pay for my crimes, why would I go and commit a crime again? Is that mindset in you every single day? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and answer because I've grown quite a bit. Was it on my mind all throughout my life? No, it was not. In fact, life will consume you so much. The last thing you think about is the sacrifice. You may think about Christ. You may think about the word of the Lord. You may think about God, but you're not thinking about him dying for your specific iniquity. You're not thinking about him dying in your place. You're not thinking about that. You're not thinking about him dying in your place. See, because we broke the law. We are sinners. And Jesus took our sin upon himself. And he died paying the price in full. So instead of us dying for our own sins, 
for our murder, let's just say we're murderers. We go to court. The judge is about to sentence us. But somebody stands up and says, I'll serve their prison sentence for them. Some innocent person stands up and says, I'll take their place. Sentence me to jail. I'll go in their stead and let them go free. That's what we did. That's exactly what we did. Now, why would a person of whom an innocent person did their time for them is doing their time for them? Why would they go out and murder again? If they murder again, don't they deserve to go to jail? They do. They are fully deserving to get the whole sentence, aren't they? Well, see, the Lord gave us this opportunity. He said when he comes back, we should have this settled. We shouldn't be toggling back and forth. Before he comes back, we better have this settled. And we have to do that by his spiritual timing because he has a process to his coming back. But we don't think of that every day, do we? We don't think of ourselves as being murderers and that Christ is serving our sentence. See, with somebody serving our sentence, if we go out and murder again, we deserve the punishment we get. Because wouldn't that be voiding this person's taking your place? This innocent person serving your jail sentence, we're out running around free. Wouldn't we appreciate that from this person? Yes, we would. But what happens when you're not thinking about it? When it's not in your mind? When the world is not discussing it? Here's what happens. Because the world does not discuss it, nor does it operate by it. When you start doing things in this world, around these people of this world, you're not going to think about it. And because you're not thinking about it, you're more prone to commit these infractions again and again and again. Because the world's not doing it. Because the world does not give reminders. We give reminders, but the world does not. Because the world will have you primarily concerned about how to survive. You're not thinking about somebody actually took your place and is serving a sentence, a jail sentence. If you guys received a letter for tax evasion by the IRS and they were coming to your house in a week to take you to jail, would you have a good day? I don't think any of us would have a good day with knowledge that we're going to jail. And what if you got that letter and then on the ninth day, somebody pops up at your house and they say, listen, I've settled your debt with the IRS. I did that. You don't owe me anything. But I settled the debt with the IRS. And they just simply walked away. How many of you would get in trouble with the IRS again? I would not. Would you guys? I wouldn't. If it were fresh on my mind, I wouldn't. But if I forgot that an individual settled that debt, if it totally skipped my mind, that I was about to go to jail for tax evasion, but somebody else took care of it. If I forgot about that, then because of my first behavior that started the tax evasion problem in the first place, I'm more likely to commit that same infraction again. You know, the same thing happens with sin. So, number one, never be afraid to admit that you were a sinner. So that means that, you know, that sinless cloak people try to give you to make you act like you never sinned a day in your life, take it off and throw it away. Don't hide behind it. Don't use it. The truth of us is that Christ took our place, that we messed up big time, that we sinned knowing that we sinned. So take that away. Take that cloak away. Take that cloak away where people try to act like they were born a pearl. They never did anything. Take it away. Because if you put that cloak over your sin, your hiding, your testimony from somebody who needs it, so take it away. Second, you know how we try to act like we just got done talking to Christ at the throne of God? Let's not do that and understand our position. That by the Holy Spirit, truth can be had in us. But that truth belongs to the origin of truth, which is God the Father, not us. So if I were to say something truthful, I am not the author of that truth. I am simply echoing the truth that was given to me. So that title that we wear, when we think we're the author of a truth, go through that in a garbage can. It's false. It's not real. That's not real. So two things. None of us should have that sinless cloak on, number one. And none of us should have a title on our foreheads that says we're the author of the truth we're telling. Because we don't know a truth unless God gives it to us, unless he shares it with us. We are not the origin of truth. We are but children growing to operate in that truth. Two things. Now, when those are thrown away, let's have another realization. And that realization is we are kept by Christ. 
we are not keeping ourselves. So it's not by my efforts that somehow I'm maintaining. Let's go ahead and throw that in the garbage can. Your life, your essence, is maintained on a moment-to-moment -moment basis by the most time. No one owes you another day. No one owes me another day. A moment-to-moment -moment basis of this life that I'm living is granted to me by the Lord. No one owes me another moment. And that brings out this truth. Any one of us could go at any time. There's no promise of tomorrow. There we are. No promise of tomorrow. Can you guys see that? So we threw away the sinless cloak. We are sinners saved by grace. It was a gift of God. No one owed that to us, which makes me thankful for the sacrifice of Christ. He did not owe me. And because he gave that to me, I don't wear that cloak where somehow I'm sinless. I don't wear that. Ironically, this allows me to talk to more and more people about a simple truth and to reach more and more people by way of that simple truth so that they can actually hear. Do you know a person can't hear my explanation of salvation, but they can hear my life? Isn't that funny? They can hear my life. They can hear it when I say, you know what, I began just like you, probably worse, but just like you. When I go up to that person who's doing all sorts of evil and I say, you know what, I know you're, you're, you're doing evil things. I did probably did more than you. You can't conceive of the level I was at. It captures their attention. Because the one thing the world does not want to talk to a person and the world does not want to talk to a person who's never done anything wrong and have nothing in common with a person like that. The false ones are coming. That's what they will present. That's why I'm emphasizing all of this, unless you want to be in the boat with the false ones. The false ones are coming, and they're doing miracles, right? That Maitreya is coming. He's coming back. He's been here three times, and he's coming back the fourth time. And he always promised to come back with a bucket, a bucket that represents a very special age. This guy was here in the 1400s. This guy came back in the 1800s. This guy came back in 2008. This guy popped up at every single capital in 2009. Every capital, all at the same time, and vanished without a trace and said the exact same thing. And this guy's coming back very soon because he announced his own hour. Oh, you know who he is? Because Christ does not come like that. He will not come in a closet where only a few people can see him. Every eye will see him when he comes back. That means everybody's going to know who he is, not just a few, and he's coming. And he's not some weakling either. He can back up just about everything he says, and a lot of people today are not ready for that. They're just not ready. That mass is falling away. He's right at your door. And this guy does return. He can only attract those who are looking for things that are found in him. It's important for us to know that what we're truly looking for can only be found in Christ. If it can be found anywhere else, you're going to be drawn to the wrong sources. But you guys know that. Because you end up going toward the one who has something you're looking for. Let me ask you something. If a person came up right now and they had powers of healing, I mean real powers of healing. Listen to me, folks. Real powers of healing. And they said they were sent in the name of the Lord. Will that be enough for you to receive a healing from the individual? Will that be enough? Oh, let me ask a better question. How many of you have been fooled by someone you thought was a Christian? If you've ever been fooled by someone who said they were a Christian type of one, I should see a lot of ones. I mean, a whole bunch of ones. What it means is we thought we knew what the truth was. We thought we knew how to evaluate people. We thought we could trust someone because they mentioned Christ. Because it seemed like they were genuine about Christ, but we were 100% wrong. Now, the Holy Spirit is never wrong. Never. But we've all been fooled. Uh-oh. And if we have all been fooled, how many people can continue to trust themselves? I cannot trust me. I say that often in COT. I cannot trust me. I can trust the Holy Spirit. I cannot trust gut intuitions. I cannot trust feelings. I cannot trust evaluations. I cannot trust any of those things. But what I can trust is the Holy Spirit. I can trust it has never been wrong, not even in the slightest. But see, our dependency was not upon the Holy Spirit during those days. Our dependency and our source of truth came from 
us. We thought we knew what the truth was. We trusted ourselves, didn't we? And that's why we were fooled. Well, do you know that what's coming is a billion times worse? And without the Holy Spirit, you don't have a chance. Do you know that? Listen to me. I didn't say your discernment. I said the Holy Ghost. Without the Holy Ghost, you don't have a chance. If God does not intervene, you don't have a chance. There is no way you'll survive if God does not intervene. I wanted to make that point strong because we suffer from another issue. Ego. Yes, we have almost a Christianity ego where we think that, oh no, no, my discernment will kick in and I will know. And so I had to ask that question, have you ever been fooled by a Christian? Because that shows you how vulnerable we truly are. Some people have a frown on their face right now because they've been fooled by somebody they thought believed in Christ. And I'll say it again, without the Holy Ghost, you don't have a chance. There's not enough of you to muster up enough discernment to know what is what, certainly in these days coming up. So the Holy Spirit's a must. Now listen, the Holy Spirit has been with you for a long time. God's Spirit has been with you from the beginning or you could not be here. Why didn't we listen to it? Why did we not perceive it? I'll tell you why, you ready? Because we thought we were right. Have you ever said to yourself or heard someone say, I wonder why God did that? Why would a person ever do that? Why would anybody ever say, I wonder why God did that? I'll tell you why. Because we think our idea is better. We think our method is better. We think that somehow we know the best way. That mindset is called a carnal mindset. A carnal mindset will often have you think that you are spiritually evolved. And you'll take the reins of your life and run the horses right into the ground. It is time for us to take the carnal mindset, ball it up into a wad and get rid of it. In fact, start to fight it. Because if we were wrong about who people have continually been, what else have we been wrong about? How about the years of it? How many know the difference between a trial, right? And Satan's opposition to your life. How many know the difference between a trial? A trial would be something, a trial would be something God imposes. How many know the difference between what God imposes and what Satan is attempting to take you down by? How many know the difference? Somebody said, I don't. That's what I was looking for. The I don't. Because here it is. Do you know how you tell the difference between the two? The only way that can be done is through Christ. There is no book that's going to tell you the difference. There is no book. The only way to know that is by the spirit of truth. And to be able to operate by the spirit of truth, you have to be in a specific position or you cannot utilize the spirit of truth. You can't use the spirit of truth. You cannot partake of the spirit of truth if you're standing in a falsehood. Uh-oh, can't do that. If we are willingly standing in a falsehood, we can only do that out of pride. And in the Bible, it says God resists the proud. And so what we're trying to do is get rid of that position of pride. We have to find it, locate it, destroy it, and forbid it to come back. How do you stop things from coming back in your life? Two things have to happen. You ready? You have to be around those who believe in Christ, right? Some of them may not be real, but for the most part, you're around the body. That's number one. Never forsake the assembly of the, of the coming together of the saints the ecclesia of the church. Also, always be around those who believe in Christ. That's one. Number two is confess your faults one to another. Now listen to what that means. You don't confess your sins one to another. It said your faults. Here's a fault. Well, you know what, uh, John? Sometimes, John, I think I'm in a, a, a trial or I think that Satan is trying to oppose me, but in truth, it turns out to be a trial. I can't tell the difference between the two, brother John. Can you uh, help me out with that from time to time? Because I just don't know. And Brother John says, well, sure, I'll do my best to seek the Lord in prayer. And together we'll have an answer. Now, so long as I stay with my brother John, John's going to watch out for me in that area. And what's not being given to me can now be given to both of us. Why? Because we're in the stance of obedience. Now we can watch out for each other. John will pray and intercede for me, not out of a selfish reason but just looking out for me. So that complies with what the Lord said, loving, you know, loving your brother with unconditional love. So when you pray for someone like that, when you're looking out for someone, you're not gaining anything from it. So you're actually, you actually start to conform to what Jesus said. And we, he will not withhold that from you. 
What happens when you're by yourself? That's how you got tricked in the first place. Remember when you did it alone? You I don't need anybody. Remember that? Remember that, you guys? I don't need anybody. I got the Lord. That's all I need. You remember that? And you got tricked. Do you remember that? Anybody? When you thought that person was a believer and that person was not, and they tricked you, and they were vile inside, and they waited and tried to isolate and get you by themselves, and that's when they struck out like a serpent because you were by yourselves. That happens when you have a, there's a spirit of withdrawing. Listen to me carefully. There's a spirit that will jump right into anybody it can and have you withdraw yourself from believers. Listen to me carefully. It'll have you withdraw from believers by yourself. That's the position you do not want to be in. You do not want that spirit upon you. Number one, that's the spirit of abandonment that will teach you to abandon the body of Christ. To go do it alone. You don't need anybody else. And normally a person who's going through this, that spirit will always attach itself to mixed emotions about everything. It depletes trust that you would otherwise have. It makes you think of everybody as, as something is a little off kilter with them. And it causes paranoia. God doesn't give us that spirit. Never. In fact, in my own personal conversion, with the true spirit, my heart is always upon other people. Seldom do I have enough time to think about me. I don't think about me. That spirit will jump into you just like the spirit of fear. In fact, the spirit of fear and that spirit are, are cousins. They don't separate too far. Normally a person who isolates, you know what the Lord said about a person who withdraws themselves from the body? That they are being occupied by a spirit that is not of him. When you withdraw yourselves from believers, something is wrong. Something is wrong. We got to get rid of that one too. All these are going to be critical for the days ahead. I'll tell you now, Satan can get you isolated. In the upcoming days, he's got you. He's going to get you. It will not be like yesterday, right? The Lord gave us a warning that certain days would come. That would be quite challenging to the flesh, not challenging to the spirit. Do you hear me? Challenging to the flesh, not challenging to your spirit. If your spirit is founded in Christ, you have nothing to worry about. You guys have been alive for a long time. Everything they're going to tell you about are things that have been here for a long time. They couldn't take you out at the beginning. They can't touch you right now. So as far as them somehow coming to do like Hollywood shows you wrong, you have nothing to fear from those things. But you're going to have to make a decision of who you're serving. Through and through, you're going to have to make a decision of who you're serving through and through. So we got to talk about what knocks you off balance. Because right now, everybody's on balance. Why? Because we're, we're among the assembly. We're among the brethren. So everybody's balanced. But once you're away from the rest of the body, that's when trouble begins. That's when you're challenged. That's when the darkness comes back. That's when the emptiness comes back. That's when the questions come back. That's when you become unsure. That's also when you kick back and you start with your house routines. Right now, your routine is somewhat broken. Right. Some people get mad at me because they're they're listening on a computer. This guy wrote me so funny. He's been writing me for years now. But at first he, he would watch me with his beer and cigarettes and sit down and listen to COT. Now listen to this. He would listen. But then about the, the second month, he said, I began to disrupt his routine. You know, I was making his comfy home. I was making it uncomfortable, too much conviction, and I was messing up his atmosphere. He couldn't sit back and drink and just enjoy himself off the simple things in life because I messed up his environment. But he couldn't stop listening to COT. This is funny. So he kept listening. And so one day he was sitting there, and, and every time I mentioned drinking, he said he was about to take a drink. And every time he got close to his lips, I would mention drinking. So at that point, he's talking to me, and I don't know anything about it. So he starts, he was, he said he was cussing me out. He did. He said he was cussing me out because every time he stuck it close to his lips, I would start mentioning alcohol and all this stuff. So he said, okay, he put that down, went and grabbed a cigarette. He was about to light it. And he said, and he, well, I'm not going to tell you exactly what he wrote, but let's just say he said, I'll be dogged if you didn't start talking about cigarettes. He says, so you took all my piece away. So he struggled a couple of months with that stuff. And, and, and finally, through more listening, and fighting, he said he fought me every single day. Now, I'm not, I wasn't aware of the fighting. Brad wasn't aware of that. People do what they do in their homes. Anyway, he fought. And it ended up being a year he fought. But he got rid of the drinking. He said he still sometimes smokes a cigarette. 
and then that you know the fight still endures but it's nothing like it was but now he can see the importance of the body because not only did he hear me and conviction was coming through me but he would see some of you overcome small things and that he said that encouraged him listen to me carefully not my talks but the way you handled your life and looked for Christ and he could see the process that was his biggest encouragement was to see you guys in your issues the thing you would try and work them out with Christ and when somebody didn't want to use Christ or they would get upset other people would join into the chat and encourage Christ that was his breakthrough well not just his but other people have said the exact same thing so it takes the body of Christ and when you withdraw from the body what strength do you have let me ask this if you could talk like me would you be the same person talking and in person and by yourself all the time would you be the person everybody hears or would you be somebody else there's someone I'm not gonna mention their name but the way I'm talking right now is the way I talk normal the subjects I talk about are the subjects I talk about normal somebody knows that very well to the point where one time uh, a discussion came up about something and this person said I sounded like I was talking still you know still on air talking it's just so funny consistency at least in that right? but are you the same person or do you still utilize your character that you made to yourself to survive in the world this is the next thing I'm going to tell you about because all of us have made a character and that character we utilize to survive in the world we turn it on and off as needed you may go to work and turn that character on you may come back home and turn that character off but there is a character we have created that we have utilized to attempt to survive in the world we become a different person it's kind of like when you hear a person on the uh, telephone you've heard them in person but when they get on the telephone they start their their, their the way they pronounce things it changes and you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, did I just talk to this person? Why are they talking like that? You know your important voice? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You have that important voice. You have your everyday voice, your important voice. All these different voices that people you know, create for themselves. Christians normally do that to fit in with the world, and they're no good at that. There's just no good at that. Other people do it for other reasons, but Christians do that to survive, to hide the person they naturally are. So I got to tell you this, even though most, if not all Christians have created a character to hide their first character, what they truly are. You know, when people said that you were naive, when people said that you were way too giving, way too trusting, way too this, that, and the other, all those attributes are attributes specifically for the body of Christ. Do you know that? Because you have to be way too forgiving, especially when you love someone with unconditional love. You have to be way too forgiving way too compassionate you have to have the best for the body of christ but what happens when you never join with the body of christ you're stuck with those characteristics the world tells you hey hide that that doesn't belong here don't they isn't that what they tell you don't be that person there's lions out here you're going to get chewed up if you use that person and then we build a different character for ourselves you guys get this so far isn't that what we did Bill, we built a character that could survive in the world, but also so that no one would ever know our real character, that real character. You know, when you're around your tough guy friends and you have great compassion, but you hit that compassion being a tough guy like them, so you could be perceived in that same light, but inwardly you were conflicted. You did not want that person to go through this or that, but the crowd, they cheered it on. The crowd was saying, crucify him. And in the middle of the crowd, he was saying, no, don't do that. This is wrong. But you never said that out loud. That character. It is that very, that character you covered up with this other personality. That's what Christ is coming back for. Christ is not coming back for the character we made unto ourselves. Christ is not coming back for what we have created. Christ is coming back for what he sent here. And what he sent here is that way to love him way too trusting way too compassionate person that everybody took advantage of that's who he's coming for he is not coming back for that hardened rambo you have built unto yourselves to survive in the world he's not coming back for that so if we have not become what he sent us here to be we cannot go and be with him 
So why did we create this alternate character in the first place? We were born in a time where people stopped nurturing the godly attributes of an individual. We were born in a decade where doctrines were so numerous that it was very confusing for any one person to follow any one thing. This is that time that called to put everything back together. You sit at the precipice of a different world by way of disclosure. Do you hear me? You cannot listen to me. There's no way they can disclose anything about any extraordinary life without demonstration. Do you hear me? They must have demonstration or they will not disclose. I heard that when I was a kid, when I was a small child. Without demonstration, they cannot disclose because disclosure would be nothing more than a conversation that would die in the ears of those who heard it. They must have demonstration. And if demonstration comes, after seeing that demonstration, not one soul is going to be left untouched. Not one soul. That's when the world changes. And during that time, that's when power will be seized in a very different way. With subtleties, Israel will be taken down. Do you hear what I'm saying? During the time of this disclosure, it marks a brand new era. And you're right, you're right, right at the form. You've stepped in the door of this new era. You cannot see it, you cannot smell it, you cannot taste it. But you've already entered in. You are a Christian, the number one component that will never be permitted access into any inner courts. You're already there. And my question is this. If you're in this new season that Jesus said, Jesus described it similar to, he said, he said they knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. This era of a very intrusive and gross darkness is also the era of the coming of the Son of Man. They're one and the same. As the world becomes chaotic, as far as those prophecies in the Bible, as the spirit would interpret them, right? Those prophecies, on, they, they, they start happening. Your Lord's in the process of coming back. You are to undergo a set of processes during that time. And are you ready for that? Because it starts with you being who God sent to this earth. It begins with dispelling all these external doctrines about your life. God did not call you to become a, be a professional a theorist of what could happen. He called you in the order of truth itself. And it's time for us to stand spiritually and walk in the capacity that's appointed to us. When you know about the time you're in right now, it can be frightening for a lot of people, disturbing. Like, for example, we did talk about the signal shield, didn't we? You guys don't find it strange that a day or two days after we talk about the signal shield failing, that talk of the sun popped up. You guys don't find that weird? Signal shield is something I'm utilizing for something mankind was using, but it's broken. It's broken. And all of a sudden, upon its breaking, radiation is coming into the earth. Now, we've had worse CMEs than what the sun has been experiencing without that cause and effect of radiation. In other words, we've had worse happenings on the sun that have caused much less radiation. But two days after we discussed the signal shield failing, what is all this talk about radiation? You think they go together? You, you better believe they do. God is very gentle with us. And he's raising us. The entire point of you being here is to raise you in holiness so that we can both see holiness. So that we can see the contrast of darkness and light and then make a choice. Is that going to force us to take one side or the other? But he puts light before us. He puts good and evil before us. He puts light and darkness before us. That turn to put something before you is to have you clearly see darkness and light. So we understand darkness because we were raised in a very dark world. And every time we get one of these situations of darkness, one of the first things we say is, I don't belong to that darkness. So we don't choose it. We scramble to get towards the, towards the light. Uh, believe it or not, there are people on this earth, they love the darkness. They do not like light. They love oppression, things like that. They love it. You do not. So you identify yourselves by choosing uh, light. Every time you're faced with darkness and light, you're choosing light. 
But over time, we have adopted new ways to avoid making that choice. It's called compromise, something that's embedded or sewn deeply into the culture of today. Compromise. In fact, it's the same way that the Antichrist um, wields his power and his abilities over the earth by way of compromise. In that statement, when it says, through peace, he shall destroy many. Right? By making peace, you're giving both sides something of what they want. That's a compromise. That means whole new life doctrines have been created in the earth for the sake of peace. Never once in the word of God did God ever say, make peace by compromising your position in holiness. He never said that. The world demands it. They demand that people not assign if a person is male or female anymore, but let the person freely be who they are. As taken out of Madame uh, Lavosky's book, by the way. That was her direct, direct quote to have a challenge on what a person is in regards to male and female. Do you guys know that? So they're, they're operating out of this uh, playbook and everything is coming to life. In fact, point by point, everything is written out. And point by point, the UN has adopted uh, resolutions and policy has been written to back up everything they're trying to do. So, so essentially, they're teaching the world to walk and to be okay with rebellion. They have taken away that contradiction factor of what flesh wants versus what spirit wants by searing the conscience of people with a hot iron. And there's some heavy duty things going on too, right? Electronically influencing the attitudes of people is one of the big ones. In other words, there are techniques that are utilized often to make you feel a specific way. You may not be aware of that, right? A lot of people trust if they're, if they feel good about a situation, they're going to do it again. So they have electronic means or ways to make you feel not so good or to feel good doing something wrong built into your computer through transmissions and Wi-Fi are these same mechanisms to influence how you feel. Do you know that? That's right, your Wi-Fi is send all technology, the small methods being utilized. When you engage the computer, you're going to get um, a reward from doing sinful things. And you won't get a reward when you're doing righteous things. You may get a headache, not a reward. Right? A headache and not a reward. They want you to do this. They add this confusion into society because they always knew this day was coming. And this day, these days that we live in right now are the days right before... I mean, right before a global change, a global catastrophe plus change, you could say, so that when they start recovering, uh, they're going to put things together in a very different way. If anything of, of notoriety were to happen in the world, you better believe they're going to reconstruct the earth government and everything else in a very different way. And that is next, by the way. Maybe that's why at the beginning of the year, NASA published a few reports saying that we're going to lose communications uh, because of the sun. Now, are you guys aware of this? So when they start releasing that the sun is in a high radiation, something is wrong with that. I would not take that base value as uh, the radiation is real, but I wouldn't take them reporting that the radiation is real because that's actually support of something. And whenever they support something, you better believe something is happening. People are, they're, they're releasing this information on these uh, ETs and craft and, and uh, um, all this covert activity within societies of children. Uh, some of the chimera children are about to be introduced, which is going to turn your stomach. A chimera with a human involved is going to sound funny. Imagine if you saw an infant that was um, part feline or human that was part bird or something of that nature, right? Or it looks like a Parts of a bird have been perfectly grafted into a, a uh, one-year-old child, which means they have talents. They have the, the facial, a uh, human face, but with a beak. Can you imagine that? And if you people were to start to see this stuff, it sounds strange right now, right? But it will be fully adopted. When they introduce, listen, th there was always a time coming that they were going to introduce that these uh, extraterrestrial biological entities were real. These dimensional entities were real, and that the government had specimens and all this. And anyway. that day was always coming. Some of us know that when that day comes, we're going to introduce a brand new society. Just as America is a melting pot of many different cultures, so the world was to become. 
a melting pot of many different species of intelligent creatures. Now, we all know what this is because we've read the Book of Enoch. We've, if you haven't, you've heard about the Book of Enoch. So you know about the fallen angels. But I, wanna, I want you guys to, to pay attention to me here. This is something important because you have to be ready for this. Many people do not know what they've been living with all this time. Your whole life, you've been living with something all your life. Now, if Christians are the main obstacle in the way of what people call the elite, then why not just kill all the Christians? Why not get rid of all the Christians? They haven't had me. You're still here. You believe. You believe. I believe. We're still here. Why couldn't they kill us? Why couldn't they get rid of us? I hear things all the time like, oh, yep, they're trying to kill you because of, and they're doing this where they're not doing a good job at killing the Christians. They're not, they're just not doing it. They're doing a poor job with all the technology they have. They, they can't kill another person. And I hate to be, you know, blunt like this, but I have to let you know this. But they're not doing a good job. Christians are still having children. And some of those children end up believing in Christ. So they're not doing a good job. If a lot of people think Satan is all powerful, then how come he hasn't, you know, killed us yet? A lot of people thought through, I'm going to bring up this is controversial, COVID-19. They thought they were going to die with COVID-19. How come that didn't work? They didn't kill us. It's because, listen, the entire purpose of the earth is for you, not for them. Now, I'm going to bring your attention to the book of Enoch. In the book of Enoch, societies of the earth were falling like flies. People were dying like crazy, except for those who believed. Aha. Uh -huh. In the book of Jasher, same thing was happening, except for those who believed. The fallen were scaring people to pieces, intimidation, all sorts of things. But when it came to those who believed in the living God, then guess what? They came on their knees. Oh, please intercede for us. You starting to get the picture? You guys starting to get the picture? Oh, please intercede for us. That's what they said. Intercede for us. Communicate with the living God that we're sorry. Please give our children eternal life. And God had already given uh, Enoch instruction to say no. You're starting to get the picture. So they can't do anything against you. Not one thing against you. So what is all this stuff about? What is all this stuff about? It's an intimidation factor. They've been getting you another way. They cannot do a frontal assault with you. They can't come up to you and hit you over the head with some spiritual hammer and take you out. They cannot do that. So what have they been doing? They've been trying to get you to hit yourself in the head with a hammer. I hope you're listening to me. Hope you're really listening to me. They have been trying to formulate society against you, against anyone who would believe in the living God, against anyone who would carry the old ways with them, which is to believe in the living God in Christ. Take note right now that the entire world, the assault upon Christianity was the removal of Christ. They cannot touch you. But if they can make you hit your head, hit your own self in the head with a hammer, if they can make you agree with what they're doing, that's the day you fall under their power. That's the day they have rule over you. They do not have rule over you unless you give it to them. Now, what does that mean? What happens when you give them rule over you? They will shred your soul into fine little pieces over the course of a very long time. They will torment you and get a lot of joy out of it. That's what will happen. You will not partake of a dark kingdom like a some type movie. No, they will absolutely destroy you. They want you to rot and know about yourself rotting is what they want. And the only way they can do that is to get you to agree with what they're doing. That's the only way. So what that really means, when you were growing up, I want you to start looking at what they were doing from the beginning. They would assign person after person after person after person to try and get you to corrupt yourselves to try and get you to live in corruption. Listen to me carefully. How many females are out there? How many of you guys had somebody that attached themselves with you that you fell for? And the first thing they tried to do was tear you away from how you believed in the Bible. Time to wake up. Time to realize. Gentlemen, likewise, how many women came to you to keep your mind off of the word of God? They had discouraging behavior when you went to the Word of God and encouraging behavior when you were away from the Word of God. Time to wake up now. It's time to wake up now. Time to see it for what it is. They have a million things going on in the world. And people are trying their best to sort out, you know, how they're going to kill them. Something like this. They, they cannot kill you. They have no authority. 
but they can make you corrupt yourselves. And they keep giving you presentation after presentation after presentation to see what you're going to fall for. Come on now. Have they not been doing this every day of your life? Trying to get you to agree with them, with their society. Trying to get you far away from Christ. Trying to get you to be prideful in scripture. To tear down somebody else. Trying to recruit you into certain ideologies that would defeat Christ in somebody else's life. It's time to wake up. May have been desperate from day one. You are standing in the way of them absolutely coming forward in full. What do you think of the Bible? It says that day shall not come unless there come a falling away first that man of perdition be revealed. The falling away is how the beast is coming forward. The beast cannot come forward in the presence of the Holy Spirit. You are the temples of the Holy Spirit in the earth. You are. They can't come near you. But if you compromise yourself and you be condemned, they got you. Oh, they got you big time. That's what they want you to do. So every time we give an inch to the world and say, well, I'm just going to relax a day and, and not do this. I'm going to do what I used to do in the world. Just kick back and relax. That's precisely what they want you to do. They're, they are trying to weaken you. They want you to see your lives like God never showed up. They want you to be so tired. They want everything around you to prosper. They don't want you to prosper. Don't play their game. Don't do it. Somebody says, why do you, somebody says, Mike, why do you think God chose to only put two books titled after women, Ruth and Esther in the Bible? Is there some significance to the opinion? Well, actually, listen, men chose the canon, truth be told. They chose what would be inclusive and what would not be inclusive. Now, can we trust our own flesh? No, we cannot. We don't know the mindset these guys were in. But I will tell you this. Despite what they tried to do, God gave us the truth anyway. I want you guys to know that. See, a lot of people argue about what books are in the Bible, what books were taken out. That's a useless argument. Because guess what? Whatever they didn't give us, God will give us by way of the Holy Spirit. God gives you natural knowledge of things that you have never read. And I can assure you those things have likely been documented somewhere. And they tried to hold it back from Christians. See, the Bible almost did not come to America. Do you guys know that? The Bible almost did not come to this place. I hope you guys know that. The Bible was almost undone many times. Millions of people lost their lives through that battle. And if you look back on it, all these battles have one root. Every single last one. From the Gulf War to the Spanish Inquisitions, all of them have one root. And you would be shocked through true history to find out how these wars began in the first place. And I'm telling you right now, the wars dealt with Christianity. That's what they dealt with. So don't worry about when you're looking at the selection of two women, you know, books in the Bible. Don't, don't, I would never see it that way. Never make the Bible about a flesh argument. Never do that. Extract from the word of God that God has permitted to have shared with us spiritual wisdom that supersedes all things of flesh. Because a flesh argument is what the world uses to, to hinder people in learning more about Christ. The milk that is in that word is sufficient. And upon acceptance of that word, God will fill you much more. He's not going to give you anything new because he's given us everything. He says the same thing a thousand different ways, a thousand different times in the word of God. And it is very consistent as to what he was telling. And take note of this. In the Bible, it says that the word must be discerned spiritually. That means you cannot discern or understand the word of God by a carnal mind or your natural mind. It must be discerned or understood spiritually. So, because that is the case, it supersedes. Your understanding of the word of God supersedes whatever they would take or, or, or put in there. If they took the entire Bible away right now, God will still have you full of his word. It would be instantly recalled anyway. That entire Bible is in you. It is God's word of which you are a partaker through Christ. So you share in the word of God. You're joint heirs with the word of God. Remember that. Satan can never steal God's word from you because by his word you are. You exist. You have salvation by his word. You and the word of God are intimate. That can never be taken from you. And you, by the way, you have become his word in the earth. My hope is that many more of us will decide to speak his words instead of our own. Because God will always watch over his word to perform it. 
That's the scripture, which means he's not going to watch over what I say to perform it. He's going to watch over his word to perform it. His word. Somebody says, who is the restrainer? Only he who let us will now let until it be taken out of the way. That restrainer, the one and the same. All of these, not to break it down in some complicated mode, but you're dealing with the Father, the creator of all things. And the creator is the word of God and his spirit. The word of God became flesh and dwelt among men, that is Christ. God poured out of his spirit upon all flesh, that is the Holy Spirit. So the Word and the Holy Spirit and the living God are all one, just like Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Within Him are these elements that He teaches us about how His Spirit flows, how His Word came forth, how all things were made by the Word of God and nothing that was made or nothing that, uh, um, nothing was made outside of His Word. How God watches over His Word to perform it. How by way of the Spirit His Word is with us. That's what Jesus said. The Father will sing you another comforter in my name. And then he said, and I will be with you. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He is with us always. But Satan is predominantly occupied with trying to get you to agree with him. That's why remembering the cross is so very important. Because humanity is going to be in this position. You're going to see humanity ultimately cuddled up in the corners of their homes, scared to come out, scared to move left and right, finding they have no defense from what has truly come to devour them. There are people right now that are marked. These are people who entertain and do in fact believe in the causes that were given to them dealing with these species out there. They are marked. They have no protection. They have forsaken Christ. Cast them down. Remember, you must renounce Christ. Because everybody has a moment of clarity. And a moment of clarity is when a person truly understands who Christ is. What he died for. And in that moment you make a choice. God doesn't have a person make a choice when they don't know what they're making a choice from. So he presents to us in absolute clarity. Darkness and light. That's how we know what evil is. We know that we're children of the day and not of the night. Those who are, who are complicit with sin, who do like sin. They are those of the night, but we are children of the day. The representation of you would be much like the, the uh, non-nocturnal animals. When the sun rises, the greater light that rules the day, when the sun rises, guess what they do? They come out and start doing their thing. When the sun is gone, you don't find them. Well, guess what? The night is coming where no man can work. Jesus said that. Work while it's day because the night comes. For no man can work. Why? Because you're not children of the night. Creatures of the night, these nocturnal creatures will come forward during the night. And the night is coming. It's just not your your, your place of uh, operation. After that brief amount of night, the day will return this time forevermore. Because the night and the day will eternally be separated. And there will be no more night. Not for those who stay the course. Again, the important part here is to understand these forces are trying to do everything they can do to get you to agree with them. And what do they run the entirety of the earth? You know what the Lord said about these kingdoms and the earth? That they're not his. They're going to be given over to the saints of the Most High, but they're not his yet. A time of declaration will come following many events in the earth where well, he will say the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. But we know by reading the word of God that Satan is over these kingdoms right now. That means every, just about every single practice and discipline in the world that causes a corruption within people is devised by him. Things that people like to do, do you think the Lord would be pleased with anybody who would entertain themselves in Satan's creations? No, he would not. And so we have to be really cleansed from those things. Because a lot of people, they, they know what they are to a degree, but they still like to do them. So long as that thing, that sensation, right, of liking these things of the world are in a person, the plight is incomplete and a quick work must be done in that person's life. At the end of that uh, process, the Lord has a sin. We will not like these originated practices of sin. We will not like them. So any practice in the world that is not of the living God that all of us like to do, we will not like to do in a very short time. This is part of the process 
of you being here in the first place. This is what the Lord is doing in your life. He's exposing the origins of things. And you get to see what you have taken joy in, especially when it's of darkness. You get to see it. Because once you see it, once you know that truth, then guess what? You're not going to choose it. What gets us in trouble is when we don't know the origin. God is a just God. So he puts before us the truth, darkness and light, night and day. This, the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of God. He puts that before us so that we have perfect comprehension of it. And then we make a choice. But let me tell you what's going to hurt. What's going to hurt is when he shows you your favorite pastime as being highly iniquitous. Get ready for that. Because that's going to shake up a lot of people. It's going to stir up emotions within people. They're going to feel like they lost something yet again. You may have a favorite practice or something passive that you do in the world that you think is harmless. Your father's going to show you the truth of what that thing is. And when he does, I hope that you can see it and hear his truth. Because in that moment, you're going to be given a choice. And that choice is going to carry an eternal consequence. Remember that. He's very straight with us. He has no fine print. He has no practices of lawyers or of these worldly judges. He works in the realm of truth, righteousness, and holiness. And he's going to present to us a lot of things that we liked to do. And in that moment, you're going to see what it actually is. Here's the heavy part. Right now, many of you, you know for a fact the origin of some things you like to do. Because God has already showed you. But you choose to do them anyway. When he shows you without question what they are, a type of internal chastisement will come because you knew better and you disobeyed on purpose. You chose not to look and not to see, which puts you on very shaky and dangerous ground because God will also have exposed. With, now, remember, judgment starts in the house of God. Judgment does not start in the world. It starts with us. We have to be secured first. We have to be in the ark before the flood comes, correct? We have to be in the ark. The flood will not come until we are in the ark. And when we are in the ark, well, then, it's, it's a curtain call. Right now, the Lord is calling us to a high and true standard in him. Right now, he's doing that. He's doing that right now. All of us have that call within our lives to get serious about things we have not been serious about, to consider things we have long shoved to the side. We're being confronted. We know we're being confronted. But all of this is to get us secure in the ark. And when that takes place, all the wicked of this world are going to be collected, gathered together into one place. A, a huge separation will take place. But in that separation, to get all the wicked people to go into one area, you have the kingdom of the beast. And if you read Revelation, not one of us can survive any part of Revelation without the Lord. So you have to be truly rooted in the Lord to survive. But keep in mind, all of this is to cause you to doubt what the Lord has already given you. All of this is to cause you to become a participant in the world again. So Satan, is, he, he's, can, he wants you to go back to the world. He wants you to give in to the world. That's the only way he can have power over you is when you give in to him. So I hope you're really watchful of this now. I really do. He's going to use everything in his power to get to you. And the only way to get to you is to make you agree with him. If some of those things were to speak right now, you'd be able to hear them right now you do that. Why? Because they are experts at the flesh. Now listen, at your core, your soul, not your flesh. Your flesh dies. Your flesh dies. Your soul is set free. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So your identity is within your soul. A person of the world, in these things of the world that don't have a soul, their entire life force is bound in their flesh. Even the demonic entities, they have no specific flesh. They just invade the flesh of others, but they move from carrier to carrier to carrier. Well, guess what? You're, you're like that, but much better, right? You don't move from carrier to carrier. You stay here in the flesh because that's what you believe you are. So you, you won't give up the ghost because you believe you are the flesh, which adds, you could say, spiritual connections to your flesh. They keep you there. But these things, they don't, they don't necessarily need the technology. But our world is based off technology that augments what they're trying to do. And what have they been utilizing technology for? To help men destroy men by way of iniquity, 
by way of war, by way of bad practices, experimentation, and a, and a host of just about everything else. It is bad because 5% of technology is utilized for good causes. The rest is used for war or for some sort of human-to-human oppression or dominance over other people. Do you guys know that? The vast majority of technology, the use of technology, is against mankind by mankind. That's who your adversary is here on this earth. And now we live in the days, right, where you're, you're, you're about to enter into what they say is a new age. And the escorts of that new age are here already and ready to go. Spiritually, you cannot be taken down. If you're still walking in the flesh, that's a different story. And you have to be ready for yourselves. Right? So hopefully you can remember the high points of this conversation, especially what darkness is trying to get you to do. So the more pride we exercise, that we operate within ourselves makes us vulnerable. The more we disassociate ourselves from the body of Christ, it makes us vulnerable. The more we're not thinking uh, that Jesus has paid the price for us for the sin we have committed makes us more vulnerable. And ultimately, you're going to have people that will accept their offer. You will. They're going to accept it, thinking that they're going to have some sort of advantage by choosing all things of the world. Some people are going to choose darkness simply to get rid of their own stress. And there will be a power shift. So all those who thought within themselves to make up their own narrative as to what things were, they're going to be proven wrong in the eyes of the world. And I'm trying to tell you what's coming. Because a lot of people are getting excited. Wow, they're finally coming forward with the truth. You might want to understand, this is going to put the nail in the coffin. Spiritually, it'll really define the spiritual war that we're in. And when they come forward with certain things, it's going to just mess up everybody's thinking. They're going to show a massive ignorance of those who partake of the faith. And this will be done on purpose to make a believer look stupid or wrong in the eyes of other people. That's when people will start breaking away from you. Suppose you told someone, don't worry about the moon. Don't worry about that. That's what you tell them. Don't worry about the moon. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about that. But then all of a sudden, that becomes a major issue, a crisis issue. And it's nothing like anybody thought. Well, guess what? The one who believed in Christ, who told everybody to calm down, nothing to worry about here, they're going to be accused of shutting the eyes of the populace. They're going to be looked at like villains, like people who only brag about what they know, but know nothing else about anything else. These are the days coming. Your faith is not going to be popular. It's going to be sought after to be purged from society. And we have to be ready for that. 